Hi. <laughs> First off, my name is Justin Mitchell. I've been a game developer uh, for about a decade, and I own a small studio uh, here in Richmond, Virginia, where I'm based, uh, called Lore Weaver Creative Works. And today I want to talk about some of the approaches that I use when building a new world or expanding one that I've kind of already put together and, and have some new ideas for. Um, so let me share this. So, oh, haha, let me move that. Okay. Um, I have found there to be really one rule with all of this. There's no wrong way to do world building. There's no wrong way to approach this. There are no stupid questions or wrong answers. There's no true valid way to do anything. Uh, or there's no one true valid way to do anything. <laughs> um, yeah, every decision that you make about your world is valid. Every path that you want to follow, every thread uh, that you want to pursue can lead to a better, stronger world. And you are totally in control of everything that you do with it. Um, so most people ask me one question uh, at the very beginning when I talk to them about world building. Where do I start? <clears throat> so I can tell you with a high degree of certainty that where you start matters a lot less than actually starting. Um, I've worked on games from almost every starting point. Some were ideas of a system of magic that I wanted to explore, and then that led to characters and landscape and conflict, things like that. Um, some started with a character or a particular story hook, and then were developed out through that. Um, so through this process, you'll be asking and answering a lot of questions about all sorts of things. Um, here are the main facets that I typically work through when I'm developing a world. You can start with any of these. Um, so if you feel inspired with one and want to grab it and run and spend, you know, weeks just pouring out ideas about um, what technology you might have or how conflict has shaped that world or, um, you know, what sort of government system you have set up for that. You can absolutely do that. And then once you sort of have that module, you can branch out and say, okay, you know, I've got my government now. What about my landscape? What about my geography? Um, and you can really spend an endless amount of time doing this. But what I want to focus on today are two of these facets because I don't really want to be here necessarily tonight for six hours. Um, so the two facets that I want to talk about are materials and magic. For materials, uh, there's a lot of forms that a material can take in a setting. Uh, I've listed some examples here on the screen. There are natural elements. There are refined elements. Um, there are some elements that might be very specific to your setting idea, uh, like, you know, a particular magical stone or, or something of that nature. Um, a lot of these materials tend to depend on your geography, but there's, there's always exceptions to the rule. And so the first thing I want to do is take a look at a standard fantasy village. Um, so I found this art, this art made by an artist named Elliot Upton. This is one of the concepts that he did for uh, one of the games in the Fable series. So looking at this, um, I want you to notice the construction of the buildings, the various elements that are used um, in houses and the water wheel that you see and these bridges that they have around. Um, notice what natural elements you see at play here. Notice where the village is, is set. You see trees, you see grassland, um, things like that. So here we more or less have a checklist of what I consider to be pretty standard 
in a fantasy village. Um, you have plains, you probably have some grass, stone formations, things like that. Um, you have tall trees, you have uh, underbrush, maybe some flowers, wooden framing, plank construction. Um, these are very widely used themes in, I guess, what you would call standard fantasy. Now, let's think about what, it, what might be different about this village if it were located somewhere that these materials were not available. So before I really get into types of wood, uh, I just want to make a quick note that most wooded areas have hardwood and softwood trees. They're generally found in the same climates, so they're both pretty available. And in your specific world, this might not be the case. So I wanted to outline some of their traits and how some of them might be used. Um, if you, say, want to make a kingdom that only has, you know, pine trees <laughs> and, and want to be able to run with that. Um, so hardwood trees typically come from flowering plants. These are very widely known uh, types of trees, oak, maple, birch, walnut, stuff like that. Um, they are used commonly in furniture uh, and flooring. And they are also used in framing, uh, et cetera. Um, hardwood is a lot harder to work than softwood. And I, I say with basic tools, um, meaning like an ax, a chisel, a saw, things like that. Um, as, as someone with a woodworking background, I can tell you that some hardwoods are just absolutely a pain to work with. They want to splinter or chip or bend or, or split in all sorts of ways that you're not anticipating. But I think it's also something that's important to note because if you're developing a sort of primitive medieval setting and you don't have access to a lot of technology, um, some of the use of hardwood might not be available to those people depending on how they understand metalworking and, and stuff like that. Um, so here in this lower picture, uh, obviously, on the right, we have a white oak. They're great. Um, in this lower picture, we have a modern house interior uh, that is in a house in Australia. And actually, the reason that I use this photo is because you can probably see that it doesn't look like a lot of most interiors, modern or otherwise. Um, this dense, dark hardwood is called Jara. And it is that color naturally when you oil it. And Jara is about twice as dense as walnut and three times as dense as Douglas fir. So while all of these little structural beams are relatively small and, and thin um, diameter wise compared to standard timber frame construction, uh, they're extremely dense. And so they are holding up that house very, very well. But in addition to that strength, uh, they also give this particular house a really interesting uh, visual appeal that I have not found in any games or designs otherwise. Uh, so I wanted to, I, was, I came across this picture and I wanted to use it um, because it can illustrate that some hardwoods are just really interesting. There are purple hardwoods, there are red hardwoods, um, lots of different colors that you just don't find in softwood. Softwood is primarily sort of a blonde color. Um, so talking about softwoods, let's come over to them. Um, these are largely evergreens. So you have pines and cedars, um, spruce, etc. Uh, softwoods have a lower density, so they're much more lightweight, and there are a lot of benefits to that. Um, one of the benefits is that they are easier to work with and easier to carry around. What a lot of people might not know is that softwood is the most common uh, type of wood used for construction in the U.S. and a lot of other places. Um, pine and Douglas fir are extremely common. Um, most softwood timber frames use very large beams to 
support the structure and and are very commonly jointed together without any sort of metal nails or clamps or uh, plates of, of things of that nature. Um, this barn that I've shown here on the lower half of the screen, um, this barn will probably stand for hundreds of years because that's just how long these large timber frames last. There are some large timber frames that are still standing from hundreds of years ago in um, Europe. Uh, timber frame construction dates back as early as 200 BC, and it's just really cool. <laughs> it's it's a really cool way to start the frame of a house that's pretty different from the way that a lot of construction works. And it sort of informs the final design of that house as well. Um, so not all areas have access to trees that can provide this sort of wood. Um, softwoods and hardwoods both have fairly large diameter trunks, so you can get these big planks or you can mill them down like we typically do uh, and get very wide boards that can be used for tabletops and, and things of that nature. Um, but there are a lot of types of wood that don't provide that. Uh, so let's, let's consider those next. If you look at desert hardwood, um, it's a very different type of tree. It can survive in a much drier, warmer climate. Climate, sorry. Um, olive, acacia, palm, these are pretty common trees that most people know. Um, but they don't grow the same way. They're typically very wiry. Uh, they have very thin branches and trunks that are still strong, but you can't, as you can see with this acacia tree, uh, you can't really mill that into, you know, a large plank or, or a, a structural timber. Um, and what that means, at least to me, is that if, if this was the setting that you were building a village in, uh, you would probably not use those trees for the construction of your cabins or houses. You would probably use stone, um, which I've illustrated here in this lower photo. Most dry deserts or dry prairies um, have stone or clay buildings because there is no, uh, there's, it's really the best resource that they have available to build with. Um, and so I wanted you to also consider this for our, for our fantasy village. If this were a dry prairie, how differently would those houses have been built um, and how, how different would they look? So what does this mean in terms of asset design? Well, uh, it means for me that uh, the way I think about an area's art takes a lot of things into account. So maybe it's a common grassland, like the standard fantasy village, and you might have cabins that look like this um, with some hardwood trees around them and small bushes, uh, very similar to what you saw in the concept art. Uh, or maybe your setting is a northern plateau that has pine and cedar forests and not a lot of hardwood, and you might have a larger frame in your structure like this. Um, or maybe you have a dry grassland that borders a desert and there's a stone quarry and a, a nearby valley and the villagers building that village um, used that as their main resource. So um, this is just one way that I try and translate what the setting is, what the available resources are, uh, into how I approach um, house design as well as a number of other things. Obviously, in this dry prairie, um, that olive tree might be suitable for a sort of, um, you know, fencing that that could be erected around uh, around the village, but it wouldn't it wouldn't serve much other purpose. 
and you could build a stone fence if you wanted to. Um, so I think the main idea, the main idea I'm trying to present here is that if there's no trees in your region, don't make a village full of log cabins or do if you want to, but find a way to explain it and, or, you know, why that is or, or what led to that, because, uh, having a little bit deeper level of world building will just strengthen the player's experience in that world. So there's obviously a whole ton of materials that I can deep dive into, um, but I don't have a ton of time. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and move over to my second facet, which is magic. Um, magic is the cornerstone of some settings and intentionally ignored in others. The first question that you have to ask when you're considering magic in your world uh, is at the top of a long list that follows it. But the first question is, does your setting have magic? If it, does not, if it doesn't, then that's a simple answer, and you can move on to something else or work out why it doesn't have magic or you know, work out technology that replaced magic at some point. Um, but if your world does have magic, then in my opinion, it's, it's best to get an idea of the design of that magic and, and how that sort of fits into everything else. Um, does it take a form or is it an unseen force? Is it technically alive and, and has its own goals and uh, <laughs> it can be hard to wrangle with? Um, is magic legal? That's a, a pretty common design trait in a lot of fantasy settings. Um, is it hereditary? How is it passed on? Is it a gift? Is it a curse? Is magic a finite resource that can be used up or replenished? Um, so with this, I, I want to look at some examples of how magic design is done rather than kind of deep dive into all these rabbit holes. So let's start with a classic action JRPG from the 90s called Secret of Mana. Um, in Secret of Mana, magic takes the form of elementals. They are literally the embodiments of mana, as it's called in this. Um, and as you play the game, you'll go around and you'll free and befriend uh, a lot of these elementals, and they will grant you powers, which is really cool. So um, Gnome is a good example of this. Gnome is the Earth Elemental. And so Gnome grants you various combat magic that uses gemstones and vines and, and uh, large rocks. Uh, but he also grants you support magic or added defense or speed. And each of these elementals has a shrine and a part or a, a seed of mana and a seal. And so there's eight seals that sort of hold the world in balance uh, and if, if you played the game, you know what I'm talking about. And if you haven't, then I hope I've explained it pretty well. Um, but this is a really, really good example of how magic is not only the cornerstone of the setting and writing and design, but it's, it's a core part of the gameplay and progression of this game, where as you befriend new elementals, you gain new abilities. And some of those abilities unlock areas that you weren't able to access before. Um, so I love this game. I've played it for a very, very large part of my life. Um, and it just came out on switch with a couple of the other games in the series, uh, in a release called collection of mana. So I highly recommend, uh, everyone go play that next. Let's look at an upcoming action roguelike called Sparklight. Uh, Sparklight is not out yet. I'm super excited about it, but um, this is a good, I, it's a good example of magic taking a physical form. Um, Sparklight itself is this sort of magical ore that is all around the world. The whole world is built on Sparklight. And in this game, the antagonist of the game 
is mining the Sparklight core to create powerful war machines, but in doing so, uh, he's burning the ore uh, as fuel, and, and that creates a lot of pollution for the environment, and it has a lot of adverse effects on the animals in this world. Um, this is a really good example of magic as a physical material that typically has bad side effects. Um, so if you're thinking about this sort of design or considering a world where magic is something that you can physically hold, um, it might be good to work out positive and negative effects of that magic. Uh, I guess not only on the world, but also maybe it's people and the animals. Uh, Final Fantasy VII's Materia and Mako Energy are also good examples of this. So here's another screenshot from Sparklight. Uh, and you can see it's, it's literally in the walls. It's in the design of the dungeons. It's in the design of the character. Um, it's everywhere. It's, it's the central focus of this whole game. And uh, as you adventure through and you start to collect your own Sparklight, you can use it to craft or create new tools and weapons uh, or upgrade. I think you can upgrade um, the ones that you have already. This is also a good idea or a, a, sorry, a good example of using a, a key focal point of the design of this world uh, as part of your gameplay systems. You know, the, in, in adventuring, you will find Sparklight. And then with that, you can use that ore as part of your, your progression, as part of your um, creating new items that potentially unlock other areas or, or, or do other things for you. Um, that's about all I can talk about in this game because it's not out. <laughs> um, I'm really excited about it. It comes out November 14th on a lot of platforms. Um, and I, I wanted to highlight this because there's not a ton of examples where magic is sort of imbued in the world itself as, as something that you can go out and, and hold. So next up is Dragon Age, where mages are not illegal, but they are just widely prosecuted. They are driven into hiding uh, or they're allowed, they're allowed to live in large cities, uh, but relegated to slums and, and shacks and just kind of shoved in a corner away from everybody. Um, this is a really good example of magic being present, but shunned and, and driven out by force wherever possible. Um, the mages in Dragon Age have a collective, they have a, a, an organization called The Circle, that trains mages. Um, and this shows that while magic isn't strictly forbidden in this setting, um, there are established forces working against it. And in Dragon Age, if, if some of you have played it, um, you get to choose your class. You get to choose whether you're a fighter or uh, a rogue or a mage. And if you choose a mage, um, the way that mages are treated in this game, in this setting, can have a pretty profound uh, outcome to your experience playing this game versus being someone who's not a mage and who isn't uh, sneered at or prosecuted or, um, you know, who, who runs into all sorts of issues when you walk into a new city. This is, this is done quite a bit, um, but I, I like, well, I don't like it, but Dragon Age's take on it is, I think, really, really well done because it's not just a surface, hey, we don't like mages. It's, there are a lot of layers to it. There are a lot of layers to the design of the Templars and, and how they fight mages. Um, so if you're, if you're unfamiliar, uh, I urge you to do some research because it's pretty cool. And then uh, next up is a very specific sort of design where the control of magic is not only specific to a single location, but it also pertains to a certain type of magic. Uh, this fan art is of a large city called Vasselheim, which is part of 
the world of Exandria. If you aren't familiar, Critical Role is a Dungeons & Dragons live show where a bunch of voice actors from all over games and anime get together and play D&D. Um, Vasselheim is one of the locations they frequent in their first campaign. And in this city, specifically arcane magic is forbidden. Um, there are other types of magic in D&D, and they are allowed to be used here in Vasselheim without question. But... I like this sort of design because it makes the player or players uh, pay a lot of attention to what they're doing, probably a lot more attention to what they're doing uh, than they were before. If you're, if you're in a standard D&D setting and you're running around and fighting goblins, you can pretty much cast whatever spells you want. And then you go into this new city and you, you sort of have those options taken away or you face the consequences of continuing to use that magic. I think this is a really interesting example because this law only applies to this area. So outside of this world, the, the players sort of get a status quo for what they can and can't do. And that changes as soon as you get here. So if this were in the setting of a JRPG, um, getting to Vasselheim would probably eliminate a lot of potential options for you as a player, um, whether that's by game design or sort of, you know, Skyrim style. You don't want to just get arrested as soon as you walk in there. Um, but I also really like this design in reverse, the, the idea of a game or story that starts in an area with forbidden magic. Um, and then when you leave that area, it sort of opens up new possibilities and potential gameplay options. Um, when that law is removed and it, it allows the player to more fully explore magic uh, in, you know, in, within the confines of that game or, or that project. So, these are just some really interesting ways that magic can be set up and designed um, as a, a very cornerstone part of a setting or just sort of along for the ride with everything else, but used in very interesting ways. Yeah, you can, you can set up a world with a lot of magic or very little of it. And, and depending on the choices that you make, uh, it can still feel very unique. So that's largely uh, what I'm here to talk about tonight. So I want to say thank you uh, for having me, and thanks to Amanda for inviting me. Um, again, my name is Justin Mitchell. These are a few ways that you can find me. I'm most active on uh, my personal Twitter, where I share pretty regular updates about my game studio's current project called War of Alana, which is a 16-bit inspired tactical RPG. Um, and I guess at this point, we're going to try and do Q&A. Yes, if <laughs> anyone has any questions here, feel free to ask. Uh, we are also checking the chat for those that happen to be online. Okay, cool. When can you play War of Alana? <laughs> what a question. Um... Okay, so we're about four years in, and I'm hoping we have about two left and not much more. I would really like to get it out maybe mid-2021 at the latest. Um, we're making a lot of really good progress, but I've basically spent the last three years redoing the art three times and incorporating a ton of new stuff. Um, so I'm feeling really good about it but it means that it's just going to take longer. We will be waiting with bated breath. <laughs> I appreciate that. Who else has questions? Um, so I, oh, I guess it's a twofold question. Um, what got you interested in game development and what is your particular area of specialization? Okay. Um, me and game development probably started pretty early on. I would say I definitely spent a lot of my high school years just like deep diving into RPG makers of various projects that went nowhere. 
Um, but I learned things like booleans and switches, and that was really helpful. Um, but I, I sort of always knew that I wanted to do this. And in, in 20 or 2005, rather, uh, I got accepted into the Art Institute of Washington. I decided not to go because it's like 10 grand or 100 grand. Um, and so I did a whole bunch of other stuff. And then in 2010, I decided that this was the only thing that I knew that I could do every day for the rest of my life and not eventually hate it. So I knew I couldn't code. Uh, I still can't code. But I decided that I would do everything that I could do. So I started designing worlds and designing stories and uh, drawing concept art and things like, of that nature. So I have a really big backlog of projects that I may or may not ever make. Um, but that was really the starting point for me to just say, hey, I'm going to basically spend all my time doing this. Um, remind me what the second part of that question was. <laughs> Or if you've already gone to sit down, I can try to remember. Oh, what the, se the second part of her question, which was, what is your specialization? Yeah. Oh, um, so I would personally say world building is the thing that I enjoy most and am best at, in my opinion, um, in the actual practice of my game studio, I wear a lot of hats, but the biggest hat that I wear is art. Um, I have done art for a very long time, but sort of started down the path of pixel art um, in 2012 or so. And now I've done pixel art every day for four years. Um, so I'm a lot better at it, thankfully. Um, but if I, if I had the resources to not do art on a project and I was able to hire um, artists that I wanted to work with, then I would largely just be uh, a narrative writer or a uh, or world builder, I would say. I got a question. Okay. Um, so it sounds to me like world building falls more under literature-ish, if not game, you know, game design, Bible writing-ish sort of thing. So mm -hmm. with that in mind, like, especially if you're thinking about creating a general gist of the storyline for your game, uh, where do you recommend, like, world building fall under? Do you come up with characters first, then world? Do you come up with a world first, then the characters? Um, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. I would say that pretty much everybody has their own process for this. My, my old roommate was all about character driven story and the, the world around them was just whatever needed to fill in the gaps at, at any particular point in time. Um, I operate in the opposite of that where I will develop out an entire world and then figure out what characters go where and, and sort of what roles they play. So I almost always start with the world itself. But I can't recommend that as, you know, the only thing to do because you really can start with anything. If, if you have ideas for a story, if you, you know, have two or three main pillars that you want to build a game around, um, you can absolutely just have those pillars and say, okay, where does this take place? Or um, if you have where it takes place, okay, you know, what sort of conflict or um, you know, the situation is, is it's going to start with. I think the kind of, as I said early on, the most important thing you can do is, is just work through ideas. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting. A lot of the thought you were, uh, stuff you were talking about with like, um, architecture and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I hadn't really heard really any of that before. So, um, I guess where, where do you, I guess, where did you sort of learn that type of stuff? Where do you go for like the actual sort of nitty gritty of like, okay, this is, this is how people actually live. You know? Yeah. I have a background in a lot of things. 
Um, and I think that helps my world building tremendously. Um, in 2006, I was the co-owner of a construction company and I used to build cabinets and flip houses and um, do all sorts of, of really hands-on physical art. Uh, I have a, kind of a hobbyist background, blacksmithing. Um, so I understand physical creation process really well. Okay. But yeah, for someone who doesn't, um, really, I would just say Google is your friend. Uh, <laughs> okay. Just, you know, if you want to think about like, okay, how were houses built in the desert in, you know, a thousand years ago? Mm. Um, just spend some time on Google. See if you can, at the very least, find references um, stylistically that you say, ooh, I really like the style or the architecture of this. This really stands out to me. And then maybe follow that thread. And it might not be exactly what you were looking for, but it might give you a starting point. Uh, and I think that can be just as helpful as finding that you know exact piece of information that you wanted. Mm, okay. Thank you. Yeah.